Welcome back to Book View Now, our PBS coverage of the Los Angeles Times Festival of the Books. I'm Jeffrey Brown. I'm joined now by Natalia Holt. Her new book is Rise of the Rocket Girls. Welcome to you. Thank you so much for having me. So tell me, tell me, who were the Rocket Girls? These were the early women of NASA. So mm -hmm. they were there starting in the 1940s. They worked on early missiles, early World War II weaponry. Mm -hmm. And then their lives changed yeah. because of the space race. Not, not very well known, right, this story? They really aren't. They're, they are these unsung heroes who have touched just about every NASA mission that you mm -hmm. can think of. And yet they were mostly forgotten by NASA and by the Jet Propulsion Lab, which is where they work. Well, so set the scene a little. This is a period when women across professions are not reaching, the, are not allowed to have to take part for the most part, right? Especially in the sciences? Yes, mm -hmm. very much so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these women worked as computers. And so before all of the digital devices we you have know, today. Now, wait a minute, explain that, because I know they're yes. called literally computers. This is their job title. Yeah. Yeah, so this is unusual. But before the electronic computers we have today, you actually needed humans to be able to do the calculations. And so this is what they started out working as. So they only had pencil and paper and these really loud mechanical calculators that couldn't do very much. Um, and from that, they were able to calculate an incredible number of trajectories for spacecraft, mm -hmm. propellants. Um, and so they are literally computing and called computers exactly. before the yes. age that we're now living in. Yes. But huh. then once the first IBMs came in, then they became the first computer programmers in the lab. What, what kind of backgrounds did they come from that brought them to this? So they come from different backgrounds. Many of them had only had high school degrees but they were exceptionally good at math. So they were mm -hmm. often the only girl in their math classes, mm -hmm. but they, would, they loved math. They would take as much as they could, but there weren't very many options for women then. Mostly, if you loved math, if you loved science, your options still were nurse, teacher, secretary. And so by becoming a computer, they could get around this and, and have a job in science. Give us an example, someone that, uh, you know, that you came to know and, and love? Because you told these individual stories, right? I did. I yeah. found these women, yeah. and I, I loved speaking with them. Yeah. A wonderful example is Barbara Paulson. Um, today, she is turning 88. She has a birthday. And she started in the lab when she was 19. She had her high school degree and loved math. And she had an incredible long career. She had a 45-year career at NASA working on all of these different missions. What kind of... Um limitations do they run up against? Because they were able to get in the door yeah. and get so high, but I assume it was not all easy, even then. No, it really wasn't. Um, you know, so for these women, they were obviously paid less than the men, mm -hmm. and their responsibilities increased as the time went by, but still, they, they had many setbacks. And of course, there was sexism there, as there is today in science, so they had to cope with that. Um, but in general, they loved their careers, they loved their time at NASA, mm -hmm. and really had such a big contribution. Well, you, ju you, you described them joining, sort of like forming a club. I mean, I suppose they almost had to. They did. Yeah. They yeah. really relied on each other. They had, so they became this all-women group because of Macy Roberts. So she was the first supervisor of the computers, and she w was made supervisor in 1942. And so she's the one that decided it should be all women, even though men did apply. But she wanted it to be a close-knit group of girls. She kept out the, the men. She did, well, on that's purpose. That's interesting. So a reverse... Yeah discrimination in a sense. Yes, and then this actually continued for yeah. decades. Then the next supervisor, who was Helen Ling, uh, she ended up also deciding that it should only be women, and she would turn down male applicants. And they're deciding that because this is like, this is sort of our place, this is the one place, the one thing we're allowed to do. Yeah, there was this feeling. They wanted it to be a group. They yeah. were friends as well yeah. as coworkers. They had to spend so much time together, often all night during missions. They were there for, for days sometimes at some of mm -hmm. these missions. And there was also some concerns that a male wouldn't do as well taking taking directions from a female boss. Uh -huh. so, so what kind of, you, you mentioned accomplishments uh, throughout this period of decades. Give us an example, what kind of things were they working on? There are thrilling moments. One mm -hmm. of my favorites is during Explorer 1, which is the first American satellite. Mm -hmm. And here you have Barbara Paulson, who is in the control room that night. She's worked in the lab for a decade already. And so she's been hard at work making this moment possible, getting all of the rockets to this point. And she is the one calculating the trajectory that night. 
So when this first American satellite is a success, it's, it's because of her. She is the one that has found out it's actually in orbit. Did she get her due? Did, she get, uh, did people understand it at the time? This is a, a very sad part of the book oh. is that um, although she was celebrated then and she had a room full of, of people who were so excited by what she had accomplished, what I found is that much of that was forgotten. So in 2008, NASA held a gala in celebration of Explorer 1 for the 50th anniversary. And none of the women who worked on that project, who were even in mission control that night, were invited. And this is a, a very sad thing. This is in 2008? Yes. So the, the awareness had not, uh, not changed at all? Exactly. Huh. Yeah, it is, it's very sad. But my, my hope is that now they'll finally get the, the recognition that they deserve. Tell me how you come to this. You're with a science background yourself, right? I do, but I actually came across the story in an unusual way. Uh, in 2010, I was pregnant with my first child, yeah. and my husband and I were having a really hard time coming up with a name. And he thought of Eleanor Francis, but I wasn't really sure, so I Googled the name. Yeah. And what I found was a woman named Eleanor Francis Helene. And there was this really lovely picture of her taken at NASA in the 1960s. And I was stunned by it because I hadn't even realized that women worked at NASA at that time, much less as scientists. Yeah. So I had to know more about it. So you, <laughs> this is such a modern way of naming your <laughs> it child, is, right? isn't it? Through yeah. Google. <laughs> And, this is and what it, parents do, yes. So it, it, it leads to the naming of your child, and it leads to an exploration that leads to a book. Exactly. Yes, I would have never learned their stories if it wasn't for my daughter. <laughs> How interesting. So you, where are we today? Um, well, let's separate it. The sciences generally, and then, and then the space program. But we do a lot of talking on our program and looking at the, the problem of young girls, young women, women, getting into and then staying in, staying with sciences. Yes. What do you see happening? This, it's, it's a desperate time for women in technology. A desperate time? Absolutely. So in 1987, uh, 1984, excuse me, 37% of bachelor's degrees in computer sciences were awarded to women. Mm -hmm. And today that number is 18%. So it's a, it's a huge drop. Why do you think that's happened? There are a number of reasons. Um, some of the reasons are education. Mm -hmm. Some of them have to do with the lack of role models. It's important that we have role models that, that young women can see. They can see a reflection of themselves in, in computer science. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's important that we address this because even for the women in science today, we're seeing that about half of, of the women leave mid-career. Um, so, you know, there's, there's so many different reasons for this education, institutional policies mm -hmm. that are all part of this. And, and I, what I like about the stories of, of these women, the rocket girls, yeah. is that they were able to get over many of these hurdles through, you know, it, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't typical for women to be mothers and scientists at this time, and they were able to accomplish that. What about, it, what about in the space program itself? The, the, the situation for women is, well, it's changed dramatically from the it period you're writing about. Dramatically, yeah. yes. So what we're seeing is that for women astronauts, this is an amazing time. We're seeing, you know, half of the class of astronauts at NASA today I, I are women. I read that half of yes. the class, yeah, yeah. That and this is an incredible striking. accomplishment, yeah. and yeah. we should all be very proud of yeah. this. Um, but for the engineers that are part of the, the space agency, it's a different story, and it's one that we need to make sure that we're bolstering these women and encouraging mm -hmm. girls today to go into the sciences. And what about for you? You, I mean, you started to say, you have a science background. I do. And that and yes. that led to writing science. You're a science writer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's helpful to have that background. Um, although in this case, there was so much to learn and so many yeah. fun parts of space science to put in the book. <laughs> so what's next? Well, I guess we'll have to wait for another baby name. <laughs> I, I don't know. We'll have to see. <laughs> All right. The Rise of the Rocket Girls. Nathalia Holt, thank you so much. Thank you.